You know, when I started this channel about a year ago, you know, before before we, or I say I, we, editor and I started this channel, kind of made this long list of like, okay, what are all the bands that you could make episodes on and rank records and all that? And then once I had that list, it's like, okay, well, I want to spread it out. Like, I, I don't want to hit all my my personal big ones, you know, in the beginning and but you know, this is one I've been wanting to do, obviously, since since the get-go. Love this band. And I think it's time. It's time to talk Credence Clearwater Revival. <laughs> Hey guys, welcome to Amity Tracks. Time to talk some Creedence Clearwater Revival. I mean, it's such a fascinating band. I mean, the story is fascinating. Their music, I think, is really interesting. Uh, it's timeless. I mean, it, it, so many of their songs still pack a punch today, just like they did back in the late 60s, you know, when they came out. You know, it's kind of interesting because CCR was kind of uncool you know, at the time, in a lot of circles. I mean, you know, a lot of their music was still being played on AM radio. John Fogarty was a master at these like tight, you know, three-minute radio songs when, you know, the kind of the thing to do at the time was, you know, 30-minute psychedelic experimentations, and that wasn't their thing. I mean, they, they could stretch out and jam, and they did sometimes, and they were good. I mean, obviously great musicians. But I mean, their specialty really was that sort of tight, you know, tightly arranged, but just killer radio single, you know, <laughs> radio hits. And the irony is that the, you know, the fact that they were kind of out of step at the time with some of their contemporaries, yet yet today their music I think kind of stands up, you know, sort of like I said, timeless not really tied to their era as much as some of their contemporaries, you know, music might be today if you listen to them. But yeah, um, incredible uh, rhythm section of uh, Stu Cook on uh, bass and then Doug Clifford on drums and Tom Fogarty on rhythm guitar. You know, that, that, that rhythm section is so key. I mean, we talk about the brilliance of John Fogarty, you know, who, of course, lead guitar, vocals, wrote most of the songs. I mean, the leader, obviously. But you can't underestimate the importance of that rhythm section, that swampy groove, just so in the pocket, so groovy. And, I, well, I mean, just listen to John Fogarty ever since then. Yeah, he's put out some good music, but it, it doesn't have that groove because it doesn't have those guys. Anyway, but yeah, John Fogarty, I mean, one of the great American songwriters. Yeah, I mean, no doubt, no doubt. And, you know, it's amazing is how much they accomplished in such a short period of time. The, if you don't include the disastrous last album, <laughs> there are six other albums that came out in the span of about three years. Six records in about three years that are just knockout records. I mean, just that pace is incredible. So... Here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're we're going to rank the seven Credence Clearwater Revival studio records. Uh, and then after that, we can kind of talk briefly about important compilations, live material. And then I'll very briefly hit on John Fogarty's solo career, just kind of some highlights, and you know, some thoughts on that as well. So that's what we'll do on this episode of Credence Clearwater Revival. One record I want to start with before we get into the countdown I picked up actually recently the Gollywogs pre Credence. So, the original band before they became Credence Clearwater Revival were called the Gollywogs. And they, uh, you know, just played a lot of you know, clubs and parties and bar mitzvahs and weddings, and, you know, I mean, whatever, right? And, you know, kind of a garage band, basically. So, I mean, you might be interested, you know, are there some untapped, you know, Credence gems here in the Gollywog years? I'd say not really. I mean, this is kind of for diehards. Uh, it is interesting because a lot of these songs feature Tom Fogarty on lead vocals, not John Fogarty. 
when that group originally came together, it was kind of Tom Fogarty's band. And then it very clearly be, you know, came obvious how talented John Fogarty was, and he sort of took the reins. It's kind of interesting. You know, a lot of this earlier stuff is like it's all side one and into side two is a Tom Fogarty lead vocals. And then the last, you know, four or five songs, it's flips and you and you, you get that credence sound when you get John Fogarty's unmistakable voice there. But this is just sort of an interesting thing. It's not a not essential. All right. <laughs> Coming in number seven is easy. One of the most notorious albums ever made. The, the title, okay, is 1972. It's their final record. The title is Mardi Gras. They are a trio at this point. Tom Fogarty had had enough and bolted by this point. So it's just the three of them. John Fogarty, Stu Cook, and Doug Clifford. Uh, sometimes nicknamed Fogarty's Revenge. <laughs> because it's sort of like John Fogarty purposely crashed and burned the band. With this record, I, you know, it depends on who you, whose story you believe. But what? So, so Stu Cook and Doug Clifford were like basically sort of chafing under John Fogarty's dictatorial rule, you know. And John Fogarty has admitted as much, you know. They're like, yeah, I mean, it was my band. I called all the shots, made all the decisions, and that's the way it should be. Well, the the other two guys wanted to have more input and they said yeah you know we were writing some songs we'd like to maybe get some material on some ccr albums maybe sing a little bit you know they'd always, you know, always sung back up but maybe we could sing a little bit more and john fogarty's like wasn't having it john fogarty's like all right you want a democracy we'll have a democracy and so fogarty basically says each of us are going to have equal time on this record. So, Stu Cook, you write the same number of songs. Doug Clifford, you write the same number of songs. I'll contribute a third. I'll sing my songs. Stu, you sing your songs. Doug, you sing your songs. I'm not playing lead guitar on any of your songs. I'll, I'll just play some rhythm. <laughs> and so, so, like you want it, you got it. <laughs> and... He just sort of let them crash and burn, and whoo, there is some crashing and burning on here. Now, is it as bad as its reputation? I don't think it's that terrible, but it's definitely their worst record. Um, I think it's, I'm trying to remember, I think actually Stu Cook, no, Doug Clifford actually had an all right voice. I actually don't mind some of his stuff. Stu, Stu Cook, oof, it's a little rough on there. I don't know, you know, if if Fogarty had been a little cooler about the whole thing and maybe let each one of them take a song or two, they were talented enough to where, like, you know, if they could just contribute, like, their one best song each, I, it would have been pretty good, actually. Um, and then Fogarty, you know, obviously take the rest. But that, that's not how it happened, especially those Stu Cook sung, sung songs. And, you know, and, and just, you know, Doug Clifford and Stu Cook were, were not the songwriters, obviously, that John Fogarty was. And so that was very clear. But yeah. Anything of note here? Well, I mean, the Fogarty songs. Someday Never Comes is beautiful. Sweet Hitchhiker is a great rocker. But yeah, a lot of those, that other stuff there. Yeah. Mardi Gras. All right. Well, now let's get to the six great albums. Because <laughs> I think the rest of these albums are, are undeniably great. In the sixth slot, I have the debut, 1968's Credence Clearwater Revival, which is, uh, I don't know, you, know you, can, you can tell kind of from the artwork here, they're trying to kind of fit into the psychedelic scene a little bit. I, I, I should talk about where they're from. You know, I, I mean, you listen to their music, you think they came straight from the South, where they, from Florida, from Louisiana, that swampy groove. Nah, they, <laughs> they, 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 they were from just outside of San Francisco, you know, so that's... That, uh, <laughs> I don't know, all, all that kind of swampy imagery and all that, a lot of that was kind of secondhand. You know, Fogarty's, I'm sorry, hit the, hit the camera there, imagination. But anyway, you know, th th this one I think is is the most jammy. You know, you, you've got the eight minute, eight and a half minute jam on Suzy Q, the cover, which I think is great, actually. I really like that. Um, yeah, 
I put a spell on use on there. You do have some covers, but you do already have some killer John Fogarty songs. Uh, Porterville, I think, is fantastic. That's a, that's a great groove on that. Uh, Walk on the Water, which was uh, co written. That one was co written. That's kind of from the Tom Fogarty days leading. So that's co written with Tom. Um, yeah, it's great. But they, they, of course, would hone their craft and make better records. At number five, I've got the second record, 1969's Bayou Country. There are the guys. Bayou Country. Opening with, to me, I think one of the definitive Creedence Swamp songs, right? Born on the Bayou. Bootleg, I, I, to me, Bootleg is one of my very favorite kind of deeper album cuts that you don't hear on the Greatest Hits collections. I love that acoustic guitar. I'm driving acoustic guitar on that. So good. Uh, of course, the song on here is Proud Mary, you know, the classic. And, and, and you got, you know, you can tell they're kind of trying to fill some space here. So at the end of each side, they got kind of a, you know, eight minute or so jam on each side. One of them, I think, really works, and the other one doesn't. The one I really like is Keep On Chuglin. I know there's some people who don't like that song all that much. I, you know, They kind of just sort of vamp and jam on them. Pretty much it's like one chord all the way through, but it just works. It just rocks. Graveyard Train, though, the eight and a half minutes of Graveyard Train, I think is the real kind of anchor that drags this album down a bit. Unfortunately, you know, it takes up some space at eight and a half minutes, but... Uh, other than that, uh, I think it's it's prime credence. All right, number four. At number four, I have 1970s Pendulum. And I think this is a very interesting record. You could tell they were, you know, John Fogarty and, and the guys were trying to kind of expand their sound a little bit, you know, beyond what, what, would, it, what it sort of become this established CCR sound. Adding some more instrumentation, uh, more prominent organ, you know, in there, some horns. Uh, so yeah, I, I think it's a really interesting record, and in then it it, it 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 maybe takes more chances than pretty much any of the other CCR albums. You know, um, it was some longer compositions too. Pagan Babies, kind of a jam on there. Born to Move, I think those those work pretty well. But you know, honestly. Um, it's kind of where Fogarty gets back to his real concise songwriting, that are the real stellar moments on here. I think Chameleon's pretty great. Uh, hey Tonight you know, was a great hit. Uh, it's Just a Thought. Beautiful song. Gorgeous ballad with a real nice organ on there. But of course, to, to me, the highlight here is one of my very favorite CCR songs, one of the two Rain songs. But it's the Have You Ever Seen the Rain, which is my favorite of the two Rain songs. Have you ever seen the rain? I think it's just it's one of the great songs of the sixties or sixties, nineteen seventy, close enough. But one of the great songs of that era, let's say. Yeah, so a bit experimental. All right, these top three are five star records. Each one of them, each one of these are classics. You could juggle the order around and and, and not be wrong. But here's my order. And, and you know what's what's really interesting here, and, and and these three were recorded, you know, they're they're consecutive, you know. So within about a year, we get, two of them came out in '69, one of them came out in '70. But if you look at the months of the release, it's about a year's period they recorded and released these three absolute classics. I, I mean, you want to talk about productivity is just off the charts, like Beatles level productivity, you know? So I have, what's well, kind of interesting, I, I have this twofer where it's got two of these records in this two record set, you know, it says 1969. But I have at number three, but I, but on the, on the inside gatefold, you have the full album covers of each. So I can show you this. So at number three, I do have Green River. 1969's Green River. The record that well here, I'll just kind of try and hold it up like that. The record that John Fogarty says, in his opinion, is the definitive CCR record, the best record. It's hard to argue with. I have it at three, but I mean it's hard to argue with them. It it, it might be, you know, 
second for second, pound for pound, the, 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 the heaviest hitter. Um, there's no real long songs on there at all. It's just tight tune after tight tune. I mean, Green River, Commotion, Tombstone Shadow, wrote a song for everyone, Bad Moon Rising. It's the first side. Right? Then Lodi, which is one of my very favorite CCR songs. God, it's when I was working with my buddy and we were playing music together kind of regularly, I, I covered that song. It's so good. Cross High Walker, Sinister Purpose, and Nighttime is the Right Time. I mean, wow. <laughs> that's, that's Green River. And, and Fogarty is right in the sense that I don't, I don't know if there's any CCR album that sounds more CCR <laughs> you know, than Green River. But at number two, I have the other record in this two-record set, which is here, Willie and the Poor Boys, also from 1969. This one I find so interesting because it's... I, I really like it when Fogarty kind of experiments a little bit more with sort of country sounds, and it's the most sort of country of all the CCR records. I mean, there's still great rock and roll on there, of course, I mean, Fortunate Son is on there, right? We'll talk about that in a second. But you know, Down on the Corner, Cotton Fields, um, you know, the Midnight Special. I love that instrumental side of the road. Effigy. Effigy is a really great deep cut. Uncle Tupelo used to cover that song a lot. But Effigy is this really dark, kind of sinister. God, it's a great song you know, that you don't hear on any hits collections or anything. Oh, it came out of the sky. I think it's a really funny song, kind of about witnessing a UFO. I, a sense of humor on this record, too, is great. Um, even Side of the Road, the, that, that instrumental, I think, is cool. But yeah, Fortunate Son. I mean, to me, I think one of, one of, two, one of the two greatest protest songs I've ever heard. I think CSNY's Ohio is the other one. But um, Fortunate Son, because it... So many protest songs are so tied to their time or issue, or they're just too obvious to kind of cringe. But um, no, Fortunate Son, Fortunate Son is really timeless because it, it, it kind of attacks the issue from so, sort of looking at classes, you know, the sort of class privilege which, you know, exists in a lot of wealthy societies like ours throughout time, right? You know, the, the wealthy class versus the working class and all of that. And Fogarty really hones in on that just perfectly. And that song rocks. I mean, it was, it's like every documentary you ever see about the 60s, right? That song's in there. It's like, it's like in the soundtrack. So what does that leave at number one? Well, obviously, 1970s Cosmos Factory. My favorite CCR record, brilliant, Stephen King, horror author Stephen King once said he thought this was the greatest rock and roll record ever made. Hard to argue with that sometimes. I mean, it's just everything's there. You've got the tight, timeless, you know, tightly written Fogarty songs, you know, like Traveling Band, Looking Out My Back Door, Run Through the Jungle, which is just kind of like born on the bayou he's got that that, that that groove on there that swampy groove up around the bend who will stop the rain the other rain song beautiful long as i can see the light gorgeous closer and it's got great covers it's it's, it's like it's sort of this americana you know uh, before you accuse me ooby dooby i want to say my baby left me and then of course this 11 and then it's got the jams 11 minute, I heard it through the grapevine, which is just, Fogarty really stretches out and shows you what a great guitar player he is. And my real CCR sleeper song, one of my favorite CCR songs is the opener, Ramble Tamble, that seven minute, especially when it, it, it rocks in that initial part and then it gets into those arpeggios and just builds. And that is so great. Like all of that is here. All of that is, is here on this record. One of the greatest records ever made, period, in rock and roll history. Cosmos Factory. Absolutely. Well, all right. That's going through their discography. Let's talk a little bit about some of this other stuff. Live records. You know, I, I'm i not the biggest fan of live CCR. Uh, I, I just, I don't know. I just, to, to me, 
I think they were a bit better in the studio. They weren't bad, but I, I've got I've got this the concert. Uh, this this actually yeah this was released in 1980, but obviously recorded. Uh, I forget the year this was recorded, but you know during their tenure, obviously. Yeah, it's all right. More recently, this was put out. Uh, at, at Royal Albert Hall, April 14th, 1970. It's good. I, I But again, I don't know, just live, they kind of speed the tempos up. It's almost like they're kind of rushing through songs sometimes. And I, I don't know. I mean, I, this is really good. This is really good. There's a couple other ones that I don't have. I know they've put out their Woodstock set. I guess editor can throw the picture up there. I, I haven't bought that. I don't know that one. There is one also live in Europe that was put out, which I don't have. And that was after Tom Fogarty left. So it was as when they were a trio. Anyway, I, you know, I'm just, I'm not the biggest live fan of CCR. Uh, studio, I think they were much better. Maybe when John Fogarty had more control, right? There are 5 billion CCR compilations out there. There's only two that matter in my book. Chronicle and Chronicle Volume 2. Each of these has 20 songs. So if you get both of them, you've got 40 songs. These are the big hits. These are some some of the, some of the other hits and then some essential kind of you know deeper album cuts. Doesn't have everything that's great, but damn near everything. I you know I you just did that recent uh, video on you know the, the, that thread that was going around the you know, the ten albums that you've listened to the most. This was a contender, man. I spent a lot of time with with Chronicle CCR Chronicle. I mean, it is just you know twenty songs, song after song after song. It's like being in the ring and getting punched by a heavyweight champion you know, twenty times because you just twenty amazing hits. And Chronicle 2 just picks up from there and has another great 20 songs. I, I don't know. If, if, if all you need is these, it, it you'd probably be all right. But Bootleg's not on these. Uh, Ramble Tamble's not on these. So it doesn't have every essential CCR song. All right. Uh, real quick. Just a couple more minutes and we'll wrap up. Just a couple minutes. Let's talk about John Fogarty's solo stuff because obviously he – once CCR ended, John Fogarty went off on his own and, and has been uh, having a solo career ever since. You know, he's had some long periods where he wasn't doing much, but he's you know, he's back on it now. I don't have everything he's put out. I have the first first part of his solo career. Yeah, I, I kind of stopped buying them at some point. I don't know, late '90s into the 2000s. I just kind of stopped buying his stuff, but. You know, his first solo album is kind of interesting, Blue Ridge Rangers. It's uh, it's mostly, you know, kind of traditional country stuff, um, folk stuff. Not not a whole lot of rock and roll, and mostly. You know, actually, I think it's it's actually yeah, it's all covers. You know, there's like a you know, Merle Haggard song, Jimmy Rogers, Hank Williams, and. What's kind of cool is John Fogarty finally gets his wish, total control, because I think he plays pretty much every instrument on here. This is one of those kind of mostly one-man band recordings where Fogarty kind of plays everything. So, yeah, there. But I guess his first real proper solo album was self-titled John Fogarty. This is good. I mean, doesn't stray too far from the CCR sound. Not too. I mean, it sounds like maybe what, when this come out? This came out in 1975. So maybe what CCR would have kind of developed into into the 70s if they had stayed together. Uh, Rockin' All Over the World is is probably one of the most familiar songs off of here. What's the other? There's one other one. On, almost Saturday Night is the other one. Those are the two kind of semi-hits and the and, and and kind of familiar songs. But it's all really good. The Wall, I remember being really good. Flying Away is a nice closer. Uh, the production on this isn't great. I this, this I, I wish this sounded a lot better. But you know, after this, there was this kind of long period 
Well, you know, in part, he, if you know much about the rock and roll history, you know, John Fogarty got into this nasty legal battle with Saul Van Zandt. You know, Van, Saul Van Zandt, yeah. Uh, Saul Zantz. <laughs> so Saul Zantz is the name I was trying to think of. But actually, very well-known uh, film producer a little bit later, like you know, produced Amadeus and all that. But uh, but Saul Zantz uh, ran Fantasy Records, you know, back in the day. And when Fogarty, for instance, released uh, Center Center Field, which was his huge comeback in the '80s, great record, by the way. This this stands up to some of the great Credence stuff. Uh, <laughs> Saul Zant sued Fogarty for basically copying Fogarty <laughs> for, for for the song "Old Man Down the Road." So that sounded too much like what it was. I forget which Creedence song it was. Uh, and went to court, and it was just this nasty thing. Uh, Fogarty has Vance Can't Dance on here, which was this, and Mr. Greed. Those two songs basically go right after Saul Zantz. <laughs> and uh, and he, I think Saul Zantz sued him for defamation on those. Anyway, nasty, nasty. But that aside, this, I think, is, is John Fogarty's greatest, um, uh, greatest solo record. Just, you know, got Old Man Down the Road, which, which does sound like a great Creedence song. Uh, Rock and Roll Girls and, and Center Field, of course, which has become a standard. I even like Vance Can Dance. I like this kind of movie. Great stuff. I do have, um, I guess, the one that came after this, Eye of the Zombie, which is a really kind of disturbing album art. But yeah, it, it doesn't have the zing that this does. And, and like I said, you know, I, I've bought some of his later stuff. Um, uh, that one blue moon swamp or something like that anyway but yeah there, there, there's some later uh john fogarty records that, that are good but i, I just I just i just kind of stopped buying them you know well anyway hope you guys enjoyed that run through ccr what do you guys think in the comments how would you rank these records what do you think of ccr what do you think of some of john fogarty's solo stuff Let's talk Fogarty and CCR. Well, please do subscribe to the channel. We really do appreciate it. Uh, hit the bell for notifications, like the videos, all that great stuff, and we will see you later.